Okay, wonderful. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, just, just, yes. Question? Okay, how many have practice? Okay, so if you have practice, you could come at 8.30. Okay. Or, or no, eight o'clock. Eight is eight o'clock okay? Yes. Okay. So I'll I'll talk to people. Uh, how many? Uh, I'm trying to arrange the uh, test for next Thursday at either seven or eight o'clock. So uh, so basically, uh, for those of you that want to come at seven o'clock, uh, basically we have five people that want to come at eight. If there are five of you that want to come at seven, uh, feel free to come at seven and we'll fill up the room uh, for those that want to try at seven first. Is that okay with everybody virtual? Yeah. Okay, so, so come at seven first and if it's full, then just come back and basically work, work it out because I've got five spaces at seven for athletes that have to uh, practice. So uh, they'll go at eight o'clock. So we'll just arrange that for the exam. Now, the way the quiz is gonna work, I, uh, I got delayed regarding beginning for you folks because I was passing out the previous quizzes. If you need to pick up your worksheets or quizzes from me, come pick them up in my office and I'll give them to you. I've got all the things graded and I'll be glad to give them back to you so you can use them to study. Is that okay with everybody virtual? Yes, um, when do we turn in the four um, worksheets for the names? Yes, you, 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 you turn them in today during my office hours. Just bring them, back, bring them by and I'll check them off and you'll get credit for them. So I want all four of them during my office hours today, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and basically what I, I'm gonna collect them at the end of class for those that uh, did them here. But basically, they're great, they're great practice. And if you have any questions on them when you come to my office, I'll be glad to help you and, and figure them out, okay? So, um, all right, so let's, uh, so let's start. Basically, what I'm gonna do now is continue with the PowerPoints for the other thing to finish off chapter two, and then we'll get on to a little thing that'll help you with the lab you're doing this week. Because all of you have lab with me sometime or with Dr. Gerhardt. And, and there's some things related to chapter three, and I'm gonna introduce you to chapter three um, it, uh, also it, for a time left. And then tomorrow during lecture, we're gonna continue with chapter three. So that'll be enough so you can work the, uh, the, uh, the, the, lab, uh, the lab results for those of you who have the uh, in-present lab on hydrates this week. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do now is open the PowerPoint and we'll continue kind of where we left off with this. Uh, yes. The quiz tomorrow also has the periodic table one through 56. And then yes, and the additional ones, correct. And the naming of compounds. So it'll be all of those things, okay? But they'll be in the context of the compounds too, okay? All right, so, so let's, let's start the PowerPoint. Uh, let's start the PowerPoint and get this going. I'm gonna shift now and share the screen with you. Yes. Yeah, just learn to follow the rules. That's the point of the worksheets. Okay, with the ternary ones. That's the ones, the second set you worked on. Okay, so you'll be fine. Well, yeah, but if you learn the you Now we got disconnected. I'm gonna share the screen again with you folks. We got disconnected. Can you all see the screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right, so let's, let's start and continue.
Okay, can you see the screen there? All right, Th this will be some review with the stuff that I essentially did the, la uh, did the last thing. Uh, we've already talked about the protons and neutrons and such like that, but what I wanna do now is kind of continue with uh, things that are more uh, consistent so you can kind of understand where we're going with this and, and put all the pieces together regarding your textbook. I, for the naming and the other parts, particularly for stuff in chapter three, I highly refer you to, uh, I highly recommend you go through chapters four through eight of Hein, because Hein spreads over two chapters, the whole, con or three chapters, the whole content of chapter three. And basically it goes through the steps that, that is sort of an introduction to it, but I'm gonna kind of summarize everything there too, but it's in, in chapter three. So basically, please continue to use that if that's helpful. Now, the, the first thing to understand about the atomic numbers, you got the atomic number is Z here, and uh, I'm gonna highlight the thing here. And if you put down here, Okay, it, if you put down the X like this, the, the atomic number Z goes down here, the other one goes up here. So basically you just have to learn to put them in the right place. So for example, if you have uranium 238, the 238 has up here and then down there. Some people I've seen that even though I, I teach this to people, they flip the numbers. So do it the other way. Remember the mass number goes on top the atomic number down, goes down below. And basically the atomic number is related to the number of neutrons associated with that. So carbon 12, you have carbon 12, six, and then carbon 14, six there. And there's also a carbon 13, six. And that's what was addressed in the atomic mass lab that we did before. That's a little bit more common than, common for, than carbon 14. So the atomic weights in the moles, okay? This is the atomic weight. This is the average based on what? Yes, correct. Because there's no way for you to distinguish between carbon 12, carbon 13, and whatever else in a mixture. They're all mixed together naturally anyway. And so for example, if you have sodium chloride, you just use the number underneath that. So please look at your periodic table. What is the number under the sodium? Uh, I can see that there is 23.9 thing. That could be, that is, is, is essentially is 23 grams per mole. Okay, chlorine is 35.45 grams per mole. Okay, based on the AMU. So what is the molar mass of sodium chloride? Add them together, it's 58.4, okay? 58 grams per mole, okay? That's how you do it with a very simple compound. Okay, so essentially you have the abundances here and essentially they're split together. That's what we did in the lab last time, okay? So essentially you have the carbon 13 and then carbon 12 there with the different abundances and there might be a problem on the quiz or the exam related to this kind of thing. So kind of breaking them down there. Avogadro's number, one mole of a substance, the molar mass, there's a mass of grams of one mole of any element, it's numerically equivalent to its atomic weight. So essentially you have to add the things together. Now, if we were to look at something like this, C6H12O6, how would you determine the molecular mass for that, for a mole? The molar mass for this. Yes, very good. Yeah, carbon is, so it's 12 times six plus what? Yeah, 12 times one, six, 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 12 times six, 12 times one, and then the last one is six times what? 16, so you have six times 16. You add them together, that's the total. 
And if I remember correctly, it's 144. See, I do remember extraneous information. That's why I tried out twice for Jeopardy years ago. But I, I no. <laughs> uh, no, because you have to take 100 questions in 15 minutes. And I wasn't fast enough for, for doing that. So it's like me and my cousin tried out and I hadn't seen her in years. And the second time I tried out, went to California to try out, um, it was just for fun because I liked watching it. Uh, she was in the, um, she was in the line. <laughs> And uh, neither one of us got picked, but in case we, we, it was fun to see her after a bunch of years, my cousin. So uh, we, we both had the same idea. But in any, in any case, the point is, uh, the brain is weird. You remember certain things in there. But the point is here with a mole, 144 grams. Now you've already done measuring in the lab. Is it very difficult to measure 144 grams? No, not at all. You can just get a beaker, weigh it into that, okay? So basically the mole is very useful for this. Okay, measuring atomic mass, mass spectrometry is used and essentially uh, the book goes into that in a little description. This is covered in much more depth than organic chemistry. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for it other than to tell the general thing that basically it helps separate the different uh, isotopes as well as the different uh, masses of, of various atoms. Uh, and then the, there's a different things related to that. Mixtures of chemical uh, bonds, covalent bonds there. You have covalent bonds associated with this, the molecules associated with this. Methane and such like that. The methane molar mass would be, uh, methane is CH4. The molar mass of that would be 12 plus four. So that's 16 grams per mole. And they all, they have their own name, nomenclature things for uh, uh, organic that you're going to learn in organic that fits very well with the naming of compounds in inorganic in general that you're learning all along. So basically, that's just one extra step. When you get into biochemistry, there's a lot of memorization of that, and I wasn't very good at that. One of the first assignments we had was to memorize all the amino acids, and I couldn't do it because the names violate the organic rules, sort of. So in a way, it's kind of like, uh, uh, it, 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 I kind of got lost, but I read the book and I audited it, so I enjoyed it, but in any case, it's just not my area. I, I, ions and ionic bonds, you have these things related to this. The ionic bond makes an ionic solid, a molecule is with covalent bonds. These are shared and whatever else. Cation charges, for different groups and you bring the charges together and make up the thing. So for example, if you've got sodium carbonate, Na2CO3, what it, where is sodium on, the, uh, on that chart? Where is it? In the first column. So that's always plus one, okay? So there's gonna be two times one there, plus the carbon, which is 12, plus 48, for the three oxygens. And so the total there will be 62 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of sodium carbonate, okay? But the carbonate, the whole thing is minus two. And, and you get the hang of it. That's the second, that's the, the worksheet where you're just supposed to put the things together and learn it. Now, somebody asked, for example, uh, about phosphate. Phosphate is the standard then PO3 minus three is phosphite. Phosphite, okay? And basically it goes four and three with phosphorus. With sulfur, it goes SO4 minus two and then SO3 minus two. So it's four and three with sulfur also. With chlorate, it's ClO3 minus and then ClO3 two minus, and then ClO minus, and then ClO4 minus, and the O4 minus is per, it's one extra, and then this is eight and I and whatever, but these are minus one associated with this. So if you look at where they are, the fluorines, chlorines, or whatever are minus one, so they fit the same thing. There's no change there regarding the ions. The sulfur is minus two along there, Okay, 
in some respects, so the, the ion is also minus two, and then phosphorus is in row three, and that's going to be minus three going all the way down to arsenate. Or bismuthate is a little complicated, but the point is the ions essentially to put together, you get those with the molar masses as well. Now, what you did with the hydrates yesterday and, and all in the lab today, essentially it, it adds H2Os to it. So what gets added to it in the mass for the molar mass? 16 plus two is what? 18. So you take the, you take the barium chloride, the anhydrous is the barium chloride together. So you have the barium chloride here as the anhydrous, you figure out what that molar mass is and you are supposed to figure out what X was and that's essentially how you calculate it. For those of you in the lab this week, I'm gonna come up with a little video myself where I go over the calculations and put it in the virtual shared drive with the other virtual labs, okay? So it'll be like 20 minutes or something where I go over how to calculate it, yes. Yes, correct. And that's mainly covered in chapter three, but I'm addressing it a little bit now in this context, just so you can see where we're going and start working on those lab reports, okay? Um, some of you will have the lab today, others Thursday or Friday, but you'll understand it when we get to it. Yes, eventually, yes. Yeah, they'll all be negative and, and, and like chlorate, the, like here with this perchlorate, this is plus seven and this is minus two each. So the chlorine is always already plus seven, but the ion is minus one. So it fits the, it fits the thing on the thing, okay? Even permanganate is minus one, but the uh, four times minus two is minus eight. So manganate is plus seven, plus seven. And eventually you'll understand why when we get to electron configurations and talking about ions a little later in the semester, because essentially it likes to leave, it likes to lose those extra electrons and make the ion, okay? Ion, ion charge for main groups there, uh, main group ions, uh, you have negative associated with that and you have minuses there. Now the naming of compounds, binary ones associated with this, this is already addressed in what we did before. And I'm just gonna go through this very quickly. The transition metals, you have plus two and plus three. So the transitions, I like to, I, I like to have the X and then it's plus one, plus two mainly, because what electrons it loses are the, the, one, the two at the front, okay? but it, it can also go plus three all the way up to plus seven in, in, inside, like manganese to be plus seven also, we'll get to that later on. But again, it's just a matter of practicing. Uh, binary things here, the Roman numerals here. And again, this is one reason I like my little lecture. Obviously he's not breaking them down into name, name, I like I do. Again, I have no idea why. But basically uh, this chart, um, there's a couple ones like acetate and then cyanide and ammonium. Those three, you just have to learn separately. And as you practice, you'll get the hang of that with that. But uh, ammonia is NH3. And so ammonium is just NH4 with a plus added to it, plus one. So that's ammonium. Um, and then you've got acetate and cyanide associated with this, but the other ones follow the rules there uh, that, that I already addressed. And then there's a couple other ones here too. Uh, dichromate is a new one. That's just one you have to learn also. And then uh, thiosulfate is another one. Now, if you have a compound like this, Uh, how would you name that compound based on what I've been teaching you with the charts? 
Yeah, there's an H in there too. So, so, so how, just be logical. How would you name that compound? Any volunteers? Well, don't, don't make it an I, it's not part of the ion particularly. It would be sodium hydrogen sulfate. You almost got there. Okay, hydro, it, it needs the GEN on it because it's not part of the thing like a chloride is, okay? But basically when you have the hydrogen in there, it's associated with this. Now, how about this one? Yes, sodium hydrogen carbonate or baking soda, okay? That's baking soda, that's standard baking soda. So essentially there's common names associated with these as well. But the, the chemical names is sodium hydrogen carbonate. How would you determine the molar mass of either of those? You add up each little piece, okay? And it's very easy. You can do the math on a piece of paper. You don't even need a calculator to do it. And when you're provided that periodic table, then it's just a matter of putting the things together. Okay. Um, polyatomic ions here, magnesium carbonate, et cetera, the uh, other ones. And again, he just gives a series of charts. The binary ones here associated with these, the names, when you have prefixes, this is for a not metal and a non-metal, like the rules I gave you before, okay? And usually with an ide on the end, I-D-E, with binary molecular compounds. So basically metal and non-metal and use the thing. So for example, this one, what would that be? Yes, very good. Phosphorus pentachloride, okay? Uh, how about this one? Shelby, how about this one, Shelby? Shelby, are you there? Virtual? Katie, can you answer the question? What's that one I just put down? This one, Katie, what's that one? Oh, I can't hear you. Okay, let's go with Emily then. Emily, can you answer that? Um, which one is it? I'm sorry. This one is, is phosphorus pentachloride. What's this one next to it? This one here. Would it be... Um... This is aluminum and then chlorine next to it. So, so following the rules that you did with the worksheets. Would it be aluminum trichloride? Perhaps, but because aluminum is only Al plus three, uh, an extra thing would be redundant. So you don't need the extra part. So saying aluminum chloride is just fine. You don't have to put that. But if you have this one, Emily, what's this one, PCL? Three, what's that one gonna be? Um, this one next to it, the, the phosphorus, this is phosphorus penta, pentachloride. What's the, the next one to it? Would that one be phosphorus trichloride? Yes, very good, wonderful, okay. Any questions, yes. Well, uh, not on the quiz, on the on the test, yes, but not on the quiz. The whole point is you're learning it and, and getting the difference. But the big thing is if there's only one possibility, it's not necessary to use a mono, di, tri, et cetera. There's only one possibility for it, okay? Like for example, zinc is always plus two. So So what will that be? That'll just be zinc chloride. It's never plus one, it's never plus three. So you don't even need the Roman numeral. Yes. 
Well, no, if there's only one ion, like there's some that only have one ion, like zinc is only plus two. It's never plus three or plus four. Phosphorus can be plus three, it can be plus, uh, it can be plus three, it can be plus five. So the, basically the key thing is it's simple. It's, you keep the redundancies out of it. Yes. Well, yeah, and another, and another concept like this one. What would that be? Yeah, sodium phosphide. There it's negative. Yeah, it's with the metal and the non-metal. Non yeah. Okay, but when it's two non-metals, it's it uses these uh, things. So essentially, but also with the, for example, in one of the lab ones you did, uh, there's a decahydrate as one of them. So sometimes the deca can be ten on on the, uh, uh, as well. Okay, so here, dinitrogen tetrafluoride. Okay, what would this what would this compound be? Yes, very good. Dinitrogen tetroxide. Nitrogen dioxide, very good. Nitrogen oxide or nitrogen monoxide. Nitrogen monoxide is more pure, but nitrogen oxide is assumed to be just one. If the mono was in there, it's assumed to be just one. With nitrogen, it just happens to work that way. Okay, yes. It could be either one because the, it, it's more described as nitrogen oxide in, in the context of that. Mono is almost never used. The one, only one that mono is used with the, with the gases would be that one, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, okay? Binary molecular compounds like that, I, I was just talking that, whatever the prefix for the first element is mono, you don't worry about that. Okay, that finishes the slides for, for that part. Uh, okay, any questions, any questions there? On the other end. Any questions for you virtual people? No, I don't think so. Okay, we finished chapter two. I will start chapter three now uh, just to introduce it because that'll be helpful for your lab material. And then, uh, and then we'll, um, we'll, we, we'll break a little early. Yes. Okay, all right, then we'll add one more here or that. I'll put another slide in just a sec. I'll go back to it again. Okay, someone asked about use of Roman numerals. Okay, what, what would the first one be? That's with the Roman numeral. Okay, so this is iron two oxide. Okay, you understand? With the transition metals, you use the Roman numerals. Because oxygen is always minus two and you want it to be zero. So what? Minus two makes zero. You understand? Yeah. So essentially when the total is zero and you've got the oxygen is minus two, what does this have to be? Well, that has to be plus two. So that's how that works. So how many with this one? How many are, are on the oxygen with the second one? There's three. So three times minus two is what? 
Yeah, negative six. So how many, how much is that each iron have to be there? Yeah, so, so this would be two times plus three. So this would be iron three oxide. Now, when I was in college, I had to learn that I had to learn the, uh, the other names and some of them are, are on the sheets. The bottom one, this one is ferrous oxide. That's the old way. And then ferric oxide. What do you think fer ferrous means? Yes, it's the lower one, okay? Ferric is the higher one, just like in the acid names. So believe it or not, I like teaching my students normally. Your book doesn't even address ferrous or ferric at all. So I didn't introduce it originally, but I like teaching you ferrous and ferric anyway, uh, just because it's very useful. Yes. So can you just put the charges well, that's where you use the periodic table. You could do it yourself. Okay, and with practice. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The, the, the practicing helps. Okay? okay, so so how about this one? CUO, what's that going to be? You had a question about C, uh, the, the things. We'll just use you as a thing. What is CUO? Um, upper What's the Roman numeral? Two. No, because again, it's a transition metal. With the transition metals, you have the Roman numerals. Okay, so what is the Roman numeral going to be? Oxygen is always minus two. Yeah, very good. So this would be copper two oxide. But if the copper already had a two. No, the two is the same thing as saying what the charge is. It's uh, it's two of them, but in this case, it's copper two. What is the second one here with the two here? What is, what is that one going to be? This is copper one oxide. And let me move over to the screen. Here. This is plus two with the O, okay? So essentially this is minus two, this is plus two. The total is zero, right? If this is minus two, how much does each one of those have to be? Plus one, because you have two of them. So this is copper one oxide, okay? Yeah. And, yeah, with the transition metals. Yeah. yeah, but if there's only one, you don't have to. Like aluminum chloride, there's no need for it. Those are only to distinguish between different ones. This, this one here, the copper two oxide, this is called also cupric oxide. Why is it cupric? And then cuprus. Why is it cupric? It's the higher one, and then cuprus is the lower one. Okay, how about this? SNF4 and SNF2. What is SN? Tin. So what is SNF4? Right, tin 4 fluoride. SNF2, what's that? Tin 2 fluoride, or it could be stannic fluoride and then stannous fluoride. Now, when I was a kid growing up and they started putting fluoride in toothpaste, Crest came out with an ad years ago back in the 70s and 60s. I remember hearing it saying it has stannous fluoride, like that was a marketing tool. What, what was in it? The tin two fluoride was in it. That was the fluoride that was added to it because you need a little bit of tin in your diet, believe it or not. And so it's, it's considered an essential mineral. But basically, they added a little bit to that to get the fluoride in the Crest toothpaste. But that was used as a marketing tool when I was growing up. So in a way, when I'd heard Stannis, 
learning this stuff of ferrous, ferric, and such like that in, in there essentially fit very well in with it. Okay. Any questions from there? Okay. So, uh, so essentially, I'm I'm done. I, I'm done the slides. I'll go back to to this again. I'll save it and then put it back on the thing. What I want to do, I, I I do want to start chapter three briefly just to introduce the topics, just so you can have something to read on today. Your assignment for this evening is to read chapter three. Chapter three will not be on the exam. We got the quiz on chapter two tomorrow. The exam will be next Thursday, just for timing things. That'll give you plenty of time to study. This is the only exam that will be a week after I finish the material, okay? I, and I'm doing it so you can give you time who did not have high school chemistry, give you time to catch up. But the other ones will be a lot closer to the exam, like two days later or maybe the next day later. So keep that in mind, please, okay? Uh, any of you virtual have any questions? Okay, all I'm going to do now is uh, uh, open the topic now with the next part. Okay, and as you see, this is the this is the next part with chapter three. And I'm going to address this a little bit here with mass relationships with this. The micro world is atoms and molecules. The macro world is grams. The atomic mass is the mass of the atom and atomic mass units. This is related to chapter two of your textbook. So this kind of fits well with chapter three as well. So it's kind of like adding to it by definition. One atom of carbon-12 weighs 12 AMU, okay? The atomic mass unit is the, essentially that. So essentially you have that there. On that scale, you have those things related to that, okay? The average atomic mass is the weighted average of all the naturally occurring elements of the isotopes of the element. So you have those associated with this. Carbon-12 and then carbon-13 is put together. Naturally occurring lithium is 7.42%. Lithium-6 and then lithium-7 is 92.58. Believe it or not, neither of them are, are radioactive. They're relatively stable, okay? The average atomic mass is a combination of both of them. This is what you did in the lab before, okay? Here with the periodic table, the number underneath is there. So the average atomic mass is below it. And again, that's the average. The mole is, is a unit to count the number of particles. A dozen is 12, like a dozen eggs. Okay? And then you have a pair of shoes associated with it. So the mole is, is used to describe the micro to the macro. In other words, a mole of water is 18 grams. It's kind of useless to go by atoms of water, okay? Uh, the mole is the amount of substance that contains as many elementary atoms as there are atoms and exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. This is defined this way. This is, oops. This is defined. That is a fact. Okay, and you've got to have definitions of standards associated with these. Okay, the molar mass is the mass of a substance in grams. Okay, so the mass of eggs in grams, shoes, marbles, atoms. One mole of carbon-12 atoms is 12.00 grams. What is one mole of carbon atoms? What is one mole of carbon atoms? What, it, what is that? What, that's weight. That's the 12.01 that's on the chart. So this is 12.01. Why? Brendan, why? Correct. Yes, that's all the isotopes put together. 
So essentially, that's why you use the number underneath it. Okay, so essentially you have there one molar covered 12 is exactly 12.00 grams. That's the standard. One mole of lithium atoms is 6.941 grams of lithium. And that's, you look on the periodic table where it is. For any element, the atomic mass unit is the molar thing. So one mole of carbon, and you can tell with all those, those are easily measured. Okay, that's the value of, have, of having something defined as a mole. It's a use, very useful thing associated with this. So here you have that you can convert the number of grams per AMU, and then atoms cancel out with that one, two, and you essentially go from the mass of an element to the number of moles to the number of atoms. There's a whole bunch of calculations where you have to calculate the number of atoms and such like that. That's more high school stuff. And uh, it's kind of useless other than doing the conversions because practically chemists don't deal with the number of atoms uh, when you're uh, making up solutions in the lab or, or doing reactions. You, we're dealing with grams and moles in those cases. So it, it just adds some more steps. The reason you have problems associated with it, how many atoms are in 0.5 grams of something, that's because essentially it's to get the math thing so you understand how to do the math calculations. So I do recommend you use those as well. Okay, the molar mass is, is grabs from all Avogadro's number associated with this. This is an example. How many atoms are in 0.551 grams of potassium? Well, you start off with the grams of potassium, 0 0.551 grams of potassium. How many grams per mole of potassium? Look on the periodic table, what is it? it it's 39.1. So essentially you have 39.1 grams of potassium per mole of potassium. Okay, what cancels? Grams, very good. You now have moles, okay? But they're asking you how many atoms are in there. So what's the next conversion factor you use? One mole is equal to what? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Moles cancel. You now have the right answer. Just a matter of doing the math. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase it off the slide. My hand range bad, okay. We'll just do the same thing there. So you have that. That's the first conversion. Then you got the second one. You then cancel factors. And now you have atoms in your answer. That's the answer there. Where did you get the 39? That's from the periodic table. Okay? That's why you're going to be allowed to use the periodic table every time. Now, those of you who are in my lab, you now have all the stuff to, you need to interpret the labs. You understand that virtually also, okay? So you now can work on the lab reports. I'm gonna do a little more in chapter three tomorrow, okay? Have a good day. I'll see you folks later. We're all done. Any questions Are you virtual people? I have a question. Sure. Um. For the quiz, if we put like zinc with the numer Roman numeral, would that be counted as wrong? Uh, no, uh, but but basically because I said zinc is only two, uh, for the test it will be counted wrong. Okay. But frankly, the fact you asked ask the question may be enough to help you realize that it's, it's never used, so you'll probably get it right. Okay. Because you're thinking about it. Do you understand? That'll help you remember it. Any other questions? Okay, uh, those of you who are uh, things, uh, it, those of you who are virtual, uh, bring, back your, uh, bring back your compound worksheets and drop them off in my office between 11.15 and 12.15 during my office hour. Thank you very much. Have a good day.
Yes. How important is it for us to come later? Do you want to work more?